I do have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Helen. She is a fourth year PhD candidate in Dr. Paul Berenger's lab at USC Mann School of Pharmacy. His research focuses on investigating the epidemiology mechanisms and therapeutic approaches for CFTR modulator mediated drug induced liver injury. Contributing to the lab's overall goal of optimizing safety and efficacy of CFTR modulators and other CF treatments in clinical practice. Alan completed his undergraduate studies at USC as well, graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Human Biology, a minor in Science and Management in uh, Biomedical Therapeutics, and specialization in Applied Analytics. So, Dr. Xi, or soon to be Dr. Xi, uh, welcome to the stage. All right, uh, yeah, thank you, Joshua, for the great introduction. Uh, great seeing everyone this morning. Uh, once again, I am Alan Chi, a fourth year PhD student, uh, PhD candidate in Dr. Paul Berenger's lab at USC. Uh, so, yeah, to start us all off here today, uh, I'm going to go over ETI dosing in the special population of CF associated liver disease and some guidance from the PBPK modeling I've been performing in our lab. Uh, I have no relationships to disclose. And okay, to start us off, uh, some background on what we know and what we don't know on the efficacy and safety of ETI in CF liver disease. So currently, the efficacy and safety of ETI in CF LD is not well known. Uh, the phase one post-marketing population, uh, the post-marketing populations in the phase one study uh, included non-CF uh, with liver disease but the uh, phase three CF patient population actually excluded those with liver cirrhosis. Uh, fortunately, small case series uh, have suggested that there is safe uh, efficacy and tolerance of both uh, titrated or reduced dose ETI in CF liver disease. Uh, the package insert states that the uh, treatment with ETI is actually not recommended in child B liver cirrhosis, but only if there's a clear medical need and the benefits exceed the risks. Uh, further complicating things is that uh, ETI carries the risk of drug-induced liver injury, so this is a concern in CFLD as well. Uh, in fact, in our lab, we uh, did a pharmacovigilance analysis of the FDA average spent database and I found that drug-induced liver injury is disproportionately associated with ETI, and not only that, it ranks among the 192 drugs that are considered most dilly concern. So the uh, current go uh, dosing guidance for ETI in patients with liver disease was made out of an abundance of caution for these concerns, as I mentioned previously, and the phase one study actually helped establish these dosing guidelines for ETI in CFLD. Uh, so starting off for uh, mild hepatic impairment, child pew class A, uh, no dose adjustment is recommended. However, for moderate uh, child pew class B, the use of uh, ETI is only considered if there is a clear medical need and benefit exceeds the risk. And if used, the dosing should be on day one, take two orange tablets per day. Day two, take one orange tablet and continue alternating thereafter. Uh, for child pew class C, uh, they recommend that it should not be used. Besides the manufacturer's dosing recommend recommendation, clinicians have actually established their own dosing regimens for CFLD as well, uh, and in some cases, uh, dosing even lower and involving dose titration. So to start us off, uh, one real-world study of reduced dose ETI uh, was by a group in the uh, Netherlands in 2024, and that involved uh, seven adults with CF, uh, uh, with child pew A or B liver cirrhosis. And uh, this involved a dose titration. So many dose titration steps with a minimum of 14 days on each step. And five out of these seven patients had a reduced dose as the final tolerated step. So there, there were four dosing steps and it started out with uh, one orange tablet ETI up to the uh, two tablets and one tablet uh, Ibucafter final uh, manufacturer's recommended standard dose. And so among all the patients, they had uh, improved uh, PPFEV1s, uh, and only two out of seven had AST and ALT elevations greater than three times upper limb normal, but this actually resolved by the final dosing step of the treatment. So we can see that in CFLD, ETI has been tolerated and people are doing pretty okay as far as this study. And so for the second study, uh, this involved 11 pediatric people with CF uh, with child PUA. And these ETI doses varied per patient, 
Um, there's uh, p from pediatric two orange per day up to adult two orange tablets per day, even up to adult full dose. And uh, in this case, I'll also the uh, seven out of 11 patients started on a reduced dose. And after ETI treatment, uh, we saw uh, they saw an increase in PPFEV1 that was significant, as well as non-significant decreases in AST, increases in ALT, and a non-significant increase in bilirubin. Uh, fortunately, in all, there was no severe impact on CFLD from ETI treatment. And we can see that from these studies, uh, these small case studies, that a reduced dose may be useful to mitigate liver injury risk in CFLD while retaining efficacy. So this is a really great start from these uh, two case studies. Uh, one thing we don't know yet is the uh, PK of uh, ETI in CFLD and how this compares to the uh, PK of ETI in a healthy individuals, for example. And so what, what modeling, what PBPK modeling can do is it can help evaluate not only the manufacturer's recommended dosing recommendations, but also see how these real world dosing uh, approaches compared to uh, the PK of ETI in these healthy populations. So uh, there are two ways to evaluate this. Uh, one way is to see if the simulated manufacturer's recommended dose PK in CFLD is bioequivalent to standard dose uh, PK in healthy individuals. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to see uh, are these simulated trough values, C-min values for real world ETI dose reduction regimens if they exceed these uh, pharmacodynamic endpoints, such as EC50 and EC90. Uh, so EC50 is the um, expected, con uh, the, um, the concentration at which you see the half maximal response, and uh, EC90 is the concentration at which you see 90% of the maximal response. And so uh, this is just a diagram from the uh, Tsai et al. paper. Uh, I think they're from Vertex. And this illustrates that uh, ibacaftor, tezcaftor, and alexacaftor um, in the standard dose uh, exceeds the uh, EC90 for ibacaftor and EC80 for tezcaftor and alexacaftor. So similarly, in our, in our simulations, we would want to see if these reduced doses at least exceed the EC50 values and hopefully the EC90 values. And so uh, how do we do PBPK model verification? So we started with a base uh, PVPK model of ETI. This is developed by Anjan Hong, a previous student in our lab. And so this incorporates compound-specific parameters for ETI, such as physical chemical properties, transporter kinetics, and so on. And this, uh, we compared these PK simulations with clinical PK data in healthy volunteers. So you dose at the standard dose in the uh, PK modeling software, and you see if these results are similar to that of our real-world observed data. And so uh, from our PVPK model, we verified that our predicted PK parameters are within the range of 0 0.9 to 1.2 of observed values. You can see here that they're actually quite close. So they are bioequivalent to the, um, the real world uh, clinical trial values. Uh, further on, moving on to the hepatic impairment ETI PVPK model. This incorporate, uh, incorporates the built-in validated mild, moderate, and severe hepatic impairment population models within SIMSIP corresponding to child pew A, B, and C. And these models uh, not only uh, correspond to these uh, three categories, but include uh, changes in hepatic blood flow, SIP abundance, and for example, decreased uh, plasma uh, protein binding in a greater um, severity of liver disease. And so uh, finally, to evaluate the model, uh, we took the modified dose, uh, we evaluated the modified dose ETI PKs uh, in hepatic impairment population to compare to the PK observed to see if this model can replicate the uh, observed data. And a little bit about the uh, hepatic impairment population in the PVPK modeling software SIMSIP. Uh, this was validated in a large-scale industry study of 29 drugs known to have PK affected by both uh, renal or hepatic impairment. And so for uh, hepatic impairment, the clinical data from 27 of these drugs comprising 56 study arms of mild, moderate, and severe HI were included in their model assessment. And so what this uh, large study found is that greater than 70% of these study arms, the predicted uh, hepatic, hepatically impaired over healthy control AUC ratios were within twofold of the observed values. 
Uh, the limitations were only that the inaccuracies uh, were typically overestimating AC ratios in uh, moderate and severe uh, hepatic insufficiency. And so for our model verification, I think this is the first time uh, the ETI model has been verified for a moderate hepatic insufficiency. And so we looked at the 10-day phase one study in non-CF patients uh, with a modified dose of one orange tablet and one pediatric ivacaftor, 75 milligram per day. And we found that uh, all these steady state simulated 24-hour uh, AUCs in child PB were bioequivalent to phase one trial values. So this means that our model has been validated. Uh, the ETI PBPK uh, hepatic, impairment hepatic impairment model has been validated for this population. So then we can extend to lower doses and see how the PK um, compares. So uh, for the model evaluation step, the simulated ETI, uh, we simulated ETI at a, um, a standard dose and decreased doses in child pew A, B, and C. So at the standard dose in child pew, uh, in child pew A, the the, uh, the AUC ratios and Cmax ratios were bioequivalent to the NDA healthy population values. Um, and in child PB, that was also the case uh, at the two orange, one orange alternating day uh, recommended dosing. Uh, similarly, for child PC, the, uh, the simulated values approached and or exceeded 0.8 fold of the healthy population values from FDA briefing documents. And so uh, the second way that we evaluated uh, the dosing regimens is to compare uh, the standard or reduced dose and see if they um, exceeded the PD endpoints of EC50 and or EC90. And so uh, we can see from these uh, charts for child pew A that the predicted trough concentrations, you can see these, uh, the bold dash, uh, dark, uh, the bold solid lines exceeded EC50 for each ETI compound in both standard dosing, which is two orange in the morning, one blue in the evening, and reduced two orange per day dosing. And just like to make a note that for Alexcaftor and Tezacaftor, since uh, they're only within the orange pills, the two orange daily is equivalent to the standard dose. Not only that, uh, you can see from the dotted curves that the lower fifth percentile values also exceeded EC50 for all compounds. Uh, moving on to child PB, so we uh, evaluated the manufacturer's recommended dose, two orange, one orange alternating daily, as well as the reduced dose from the case studies, which is one orange daily. And the predicted trough concentrations, once again, at both uh, the average and the uh, fifth, lower fifth percentile exceeded EC50 for each ETI compound in both dosing. So this uh, corroborates with the efficacy that you've seen from the case studies. And so uh, we, we believe that uh, dosing down in child PB is possible. Uh, furthermore, in child PC, um, so first I'd like to make note that uh, the majority of people uh, with CFLD are child PA with some, uh, some patients in child PB. Uh, child PC is exceptionally rare. We haven't seen any in our clinic, but in the case that there are patients with child PC, we've done predictions for that as well. And so uh, on one orange daily, dosing very low, the predicted trough concentration still exceeded EC50 for each ETI compound at this reduced dose. Uh, and the dashed curves at the lower fifth percentile values as well exceeded EC50. And so in all, we can see that there are emerging data case studies that support the efficacy and safety of ETI in CF liver disease. And the PBPK simulations uh, from our lab demonstrate that the manufactured dosing guidelines for child pew A and B are bioequivalent to the observed standard dose ETI PK parameters in the healthy population. Furthermore, the PBPK simulations also suggests that further ETI dose reduction could be possible in child pew A and B while, maintain, while maintaining concentrations above EC50. And this is in agreement with uh, data from the real world ETI dose reduction uh, from the case series. Additionally, uh, we did dosing guidance for patients with severe hepatic impairment child, uh, child pew C uh, using our PVPK model. And so that's the one orange per day in child pew C. 
Uh, finally, we believe that additional clinical outcome data are definitely needed to confirm the efficacy and safety of ETI dose reduction uh, strategies in CFLD. So these uh, simulations are a great way to see if a dose reduction is possible. So then we definitely want to see in the future uh, clinical verification of what we simulated. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my advisor, Dr. Paul Berenger, as well as um, other members of the CF clinic at USC, Dr. Peter Chung and Dr. Duke Rao, uh, as well as former lab member, Dr. Anjan Hong, who is now a professor at a university in Korea, and also funding from the Anton Yelchin Foundation. So thank you everyone for listening, and yeah, I'll open the floor to any questions. All right, we will, if you have questions for, um, for Alan, please put those in the, in the app, and then we'll save those for the end. Great, awesome. And uh, check out my poster, number 492. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, that was great. Um, like Josh said, I'm um, Kayla Manasco. I'm a clinical professor at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy and a clinical pharmacist in the Pediatric Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at University of Florida. Um, and I've been doing CF for quite a while, um, but I'm very happy to be here today to present, uh, to moderate this session. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Hillary Vogt. She is a pediatric clinical pharmacist at the Outpatient CF uh, Center at Riley Hospital for Children. She's worked in both adult and pediatric patients um, clinics there, first at IU Health since 2018, and then transitioned over to the pediatric clinic. And she um, enjoys, uh, her main thing is, uh, research interest is uh, pediatric transition to adult care and also reproductive health. And in her spare time, she enjoys time, spending time with her two dogs and her new baby that's seven months old. So uh, please join her in, um, she's gonna talk about the impact of number of pharmacies on Dornase Alpha medication possession ratio in children with cystic fibrosis. Thank you, Kaylin, for the introduction. Um, and before I start, I do wanna recognize that I had some collaborators on this project. So Julie Langhorst, our wonderful CF pharmacy technician. Also Katie Howell, former PGY1 pharmacy resident with IU Health, um, and Rebecca Pettit worked with me on this project this year. I don't have any disclosures. Um, and as I was putting this together, I was reminded back to about six years ago when I started working in CF, um, coming from the inpatient side of the world, and I remember reviewing patient profiles thinking, these people fill at so many pharmacies and I am going to look like a genius when I fix this. Like, I'm gonna get everyone down to one pharmacy. <laughs> I was really quickly humbled when I realized that's not how our world works. So um, here we are. I'm gonna have a talk today that's not quite as technical as some of the others in this session, but I think this will put some data and metrics around something we all anecdotally know to be true. Um, so we do have some prior publications in CF indicating that higher medication adherence has been associated with fewer pulmonary exacerbations and also a higher baseline FEV1 in our patients, which is really important for our clinical outcomes. Uh, we also have CF colleagues that have shown that using a single health system associated pharmacy to fill cystic fibrosis medications is also associated with higher medication adherence. So. We all see this every day. We know that our patients who are able to fill with our health system pharmacies tend to get their medications more easily and consistently, and hopefully that translates into those clinical outcomes. But it's kind of in direct competition with the current state of our system that we have here. So barriers to being able to use just one health system pharmacy include insurance companies requiring um, use of a contracted pharmacy for patients who are on their plan, and also some limited distribution network um, stipulations for specialty drugs, which even further can limit those options. So if you're on the pharmacist listserv, you don't know anything about this right now. We, we aren't having a small crisis <laughs> over our uh, contract pharmacies and limited distribution networks. But um, you know, ultimately what this means is that these really complex regimens, the difficult logistics of actually getting these drugs to our patients are true barriers to medication adherence. Um, the objective of our study was to compare the average medication possession ratio or MPR 
for Dornay's Alpha between pa uh, pediatric patients with CF who use one specialty pharmacy to fill all of their CF medications. We wanted to compare those um, to people who had to use more than one specialty pharmacy. For secondary outcomes, we looked at hospitalizations and change in percent predicted FEV1 over the study period. And then we did some additional data breakdowns of people with Medicaid and um, versus private commercial insurance. This was an IRB approved retrospective study. We just looked at um, pediatric people with CF who were prescribed Dornay's Alpha in the calendar year of 2019. We picked that time period specifically because it was before ETI came to market and a lot of people's airway clearance regimens changed around that time. So we wanted to look back um, before that was widely available to patients to kind of minimize any adherence um, changes being due to their modulator therapy. Um, we also wanted them to have at least six months of pharmacy fill history to be able to calculate that medication possession ratio. Um, so for medication possession ratio, if you're not as familiar with that as a metric, um, it's calculated based on the number of days of a prescription being filled. So what supply is available to the patient based on what they have filled divided by the number of days that they were prescribed that therapy. So that's how we calculated this for Dornay's Alpha. Um, it's a really good indirect marker of medication adherence because of course, if the patient doesn't have the drug available to take, they can't take it. Um, and you want that number to be as close as possible to one. One would correspond to 100% of those days that they were prescribed the therapy, they had it available to take. Um, and then we adjusted this number for our study to exclude any days that people were in the hospital because if they were hospitalized, they would be receiving hospital supply of drug and therefore have some extra supply when they went home. So we took out those days to give a fair representation of um, their NPR available to them at home. For our demographic uh, or for our data collection, we looked at some basic demographics, type of insurance, FEV1 data, hospitalizations, and then for our NPR calculations, what specialty pharmacies people were using for their CF maintenance medications, which I'll get more specific into what that includes in a minute, um, and then the days of uh, Dornay's Alpha supplied during the study period. And we did a data analysis that you can see here. We ultimately reviewed 163 patients and excluded 45 of them, mostly because we did not have the PFT data available and we wanted to have um, FEV1 as a, as a data point here. At the end, we were able to include 29 patients who filled their Dornay's Alpha plus all of their other CF um, core therapies at just one pharmacy and 56 people who filled at multiple different pharmacies for those drugs. For our baseline characteristics, they were very similar from the people using one pharmacy group to the multiple pharmacy group. So no statistical difference seen in baseline characteristics between the two. Um, on you know, the median age between both groups was about 10 to 11 years old because um, we had to exclude those people who didn't have PFT data. Um, on average, the baseline FEV1 was about um, 95 to 100%. Um, we have an overwhelmingly Caucasian population in Indiana, so we have that. And then about 50 to 60% of our population had um, Medicaid as their primary insurance payer. So when I say that they fill all their CF medications at one pharmacy, we don't necessarily mean they fill every single drug they take at one pharmacy. These are the ones that we looked at. Um, and so not all patients were on every single one of these drugs, but this is the breakdown of concurrent medications um, and, and how frequently people were prescribed them. Again, no statistical difference seen between the two groups in terms of their concurrent medications they were taking during the study period. Um, just a reminder that we did this in 2019, so that's why you see predominantly for your CFTR modulators, people were getting um, either Tez-Iva or Lumiva as their CFTR modulator. So for our primary results, the medication possession ratio for Dornay's Alpha, people who were able to just use one pharmacy for their CF medications had a median NPR of 0 0.98, which corresponds to 98% um, versus 0.64 or 64% for those who had to use multiple pharmacies, and that was statistically significant. Another interesting point that we found is that people had a less significant decrease in 
their percent predicted FEV1 during the study period when they were able to just use one pharmacy. So um, a median of 1% reduction during that year versus a 5% reduction in people who had to fill their drugs at multiple pharmacies. And I think that's very clinically significant because we're just looking at one year here. Uh, we did not show a statistical change in or difference in the number of hospitalizations or length of hospitalizations. Um, a couple of charts here just showing that this data is consistent throughout our overall group versus our Medicaid subgroup versus our private insurance subgroup. So in the orange piece of the pie here, you see people who were able to just use one pharmacy. It's about a third of patients in all three of those groups. So it's consistent among payers uh, with two thirds of people having to use multiple pharmacies to get their medications. And I'll break this down a little further, but once again, looking at medication possession ratio, again, this data was um, consistent between our groups. So in orange, the orange bar, you see people who were just able to use one pharmacy to fill their medications. You can see that that medication possession ratio line is much closer to one in all three of those groups versus you know, 0.5 to 0.6 um, in people who had to use multiple pharmacies. Again, I'll give more information on that. So to break down this Medicaid subgroup, um, again, we did not have any difference in baseline characteristics between our um, one pharmacy and multiple pharmacy groups. But for our medication possession ratio, this was statistically significant um, at 0.95 or a 95% medication possession ratio for our one pharmacy group versus 60% for our multiple pharmacy group. Um, in this population, there was no significant change in FEV1 or hospitalization data. Um, and again, just showing that there's no statistical difference in those concurrent medications that they were prescribed when we're just isolating out those Medicaid patients. Um, and here again, for private insurance, no difference between the two groups in baseline characteristics, pretty similar to our overall population, although a slightly higher baseline um, FEV1 in this, in this group at about 100%. Um, and here again, we show that people with commercial insurance or private insurance, the medication possession ratio, um, the median was 0.99 or 99% if they were able to just use one pharmacy versus 0.58 or 58% for people who had to use multiple pharmacies, which was um, a statistically significant result for the study. Um, and again, no change in percent predicted FEV1 or hospitalization. And again, similar medications between the two groups as well. So in conclusion, pediatric people with cystic fibrosis who were able to use just one pharmacy to fill their medications had a higher medication possession ratio compared to those that had to use multiple pharmacies. This was also associated with less decline in lung, fa uh, lung function for our patients overall during this study period. There was also um, you know, this benefit in improved medication possession ratio was shown across the payer groups. So whether they had Medicaid or private insurance. So just in case anyone here has you know, some pull with pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, specialty pharmacies, the ability for our patients to just use one pharmacy is so beneficial for them. It is helpful for their medication adherence. Of course, importantly, their quality of life because this is burdensome to actually navigate getting all of their drugs. Um, but importantly, we know that that translates into their clinical outcomes, which is so important. So all insurance plans should adjust their covered pharmacies to simplify medication access for their members and, you know, with the goal of improving patient care and improving quality of life. Thank you, Hillary. I feel that on so many levels. When I came in, I was very much on the train of trying to get pharmacies consolidated down to at least one or two, but I've got some with three or four, and that's becoming a bit more common these days. Anyway, thank you so much for that. And again, if you have questions for Hillary, please put those in the app, because if you're like me, you'll forget by the time we get to the end of the session. Go ahead and throw those in there. That way, you know, if you forget between now and the end of the session, they'll be there for us, and we can pull those up um, as we get to the end of the session. Uh, Madeline Sanders.
Madeline Sanders is a third year PhD candidate in Dr. Paul Behringer's lab at USC Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, earned her Bachelor of Science in Chemical Biology in 2022 at the College of Chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, and an undergraduate, as an undergraduate, she worked in research assistant in Dr. Jamie, mm, I'm not gonna try that last name, focusing on the incorporation of non-natural amino acids by the ribosome. Currently, Madeline is enrolled in clinical and experimental therapeutics doctoral program at USC and is pursuing a master's in management of drug development. Her graduate research em emphasizes translational approaches, particularly in the developing novel antibiotic therapies for non-tuberculosis mycobacterial pulmonary disease, specifically targeting mycobacterium obsessives, infections, and cystic fibrosis. Through her work, she aims to evaluate the pharmacokinetic safety and therapeutic potential of innovative antibiotics and combinations to address critical gaps in existing treatment strategies. Welcome. All right, hi everyone. Uh, like you said, my name is Madeline Sanders and I wanted to share my project with you guys on the pharmacokinetics of ETI uh, with co-administration of rifibutin. So I have no relationships to disclose in this presentation. Uh, as many of you know, non-tuberculosis mycobacteria is an opportunistic environmental pathogen that's found in soil, dust, and water sources. Uh, while it's usually not harmful to healthy individuals, uh, it's been increasingly isolated from the sputum of people with CF, with prevalence rising from about 1.3% in 1984 to 13.9% uh, in 2019. Uh, the prevalence of NTM also increases with age from about 10% in children to 30% uh, in adults over 40 years old. Uh, the two most common species of NTM are Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, uh, and Mycobacterium obsessus complex, or uh, MABSC. Uh, people with CF are generally predisposed uh, to NTM. Uh, this is due to reduced CFTR-mediated reactive oxygen species generation uh, within macrophages that leads to uh, reduced intracellular killing. So intracellular bacteria uh, kind of act as a reservoir for infection and also make it very difficult for antibiotics to penetrate uh, and eradicate these infections. Uh, MAC and MABSC both uh, have evolved mechanisms to evade host immune responses and survive intracellularly. Uh, NTM can lead to progressive inflammatory lung damage, uh, known as NTMPD, and this is associated with uh, accelerated lung function decline, uh, worse clinical outcomes, and then also higher mortality in people with CF. Uh, in particular, Mycobacterium obsessus uh, has extremely detrimental health effects on people with CF. Uh, in a longitudinal registry study of about 432 CF patients, uh, MFCSS was associated with the worst impact on lung function. Uh, the, uh, one of the major barriers to treatment of NTMPD, and more specifically uh, MABSC-PD, is the limited number of safe and effective antibiotics for treatment. Uh, and we believe that rifamycin antibiotics might present a promising new class to add to this potential treatment regimen. Um, one rifamycin antibiotic, uh, rifampicin, is currently a guideline recommended treatment for MAC PD uh, in combination with azithromycin and ethambutol. Uh, rifamycin antibiotics in general also have synergistic potential with other current uh, guideline recommended antibiotics uh, due to their potential to reduce uh, inducible macrolide resistance in NTM. Um, however, uh, ETI is currently, um, or rifampin is currently contraindicated uh, with ETI. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit more about why in the next slide. Um, but this is further substantiated by a case report of a patient with CF uh, that took rifampin with ETI and they experienced an acute pulmonary exacerbation um, and then returned to fa or failed to return to baseline lung function after treatment. Uh, this makes prescribers uh, extremely hesitant to prescribe rifampin, obviously, with ETI, uh, and makes them reluctant to prescribe it for treatment of NTM infections in people with CF. And the absence of rifamycins in treatment in people with CF uh, deprives them of one of the first-line therapies and significantly compromises a standard care. 
Um, as far as why they are contraindicated, rifamycins are generally contraindicated, uh, this is because ETI, so all three components, Alexcaptor, Tezcaptor, and Ivacaptor, are all CYP3A substrates uh, metabolized in the liver. And this generally, uh, having metabolism in the liver increases the risk for drug-drug interactions, but more specifically, using uh, CYP3A inducers uh, increases enzymatic activity of CYP3A, and then also uh, reduces systemic ETI exposure uh, and therefore can decrease therapeutic efficacy. Um, in a study uh, outlined in the package insert of ETI, uh, co-administration of rifampin reduced ivacaptor levels by 89%, which is extremely significant. Uh, they also they didn't do any studies uh, with lexcaptor and tezcaptor uh, with rifampin, but they are also CYP3A substrates, and so they're also uh, expected to decrease significantly. Uh, however, we think rifibutin, another rifamycin antibiotic, uh, presents a potential alternative to rifampin for NCMPD in people with CF. Uh, so I don't know if you noticed, but in the package insert highlight that I had, um, rifibutin is also technically contraindicated with ETI, uh, but we think that this is more of a, um, they kind of lumped it in there. They didn't actually do any studies with rifibutin, and so that's kind of where my project comes in. Uh, Rifibutin is the only rifamycin antibiotic effective against both MAC and MABSC PD. It also has a significant intracellular and lung tissue penetration. Um, we believe from studies uh, or previous studies and in silico simulations that it's only a moderate CYP3A inhibitor uh, rather than a strong CYP3A inhibitor. Um, and this potentially uh, possesses a lower risk of interaction uh, than rifampin. In a pharmacokinetic study of lisirivine, which is another CYP3A substrate, uh, there was an 85% reduction in the area under the curve uh, with rifampin, but only a 34% reduction uh, with rifibutin. And then we also conducted, or Dr. Anjan Hong, a former PhD student in our lab, uh, conducted some preliminary in silico simulations to predict uh, the ETI rifibutin interaction that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Uh, so this is just a summary of Dr. Anjan Hong's work uh, with the preliminary physiologically based uh, PK modeling or PBPK modeling simulations. Uh, Dr. Hong found that uh, or suggested that a higher ETI dose uh, would be needed for adequate drug exposure with rifibutin co-administration. Uh, as you guys know, the standard ETI dose is two orange ETI tablets in the morning and then one blue Ivacaftor tablet uh, in the evening. Uh, Dr. Hong's uh, preliminary simulation suggested that the modified dose would be two orange and two blue in the morning, one orange and two blue at night, which is a pretty significant dose increase here. Um, but as many of you know, and as we've talked about, uh, insurance would likely not cover this. This is a, a very large dose increase. Um, and so she also wanted to assess uh, standard dosing with rifibutin in her preliminary simulations. Um, so what she found is that um, Alexacaptor, Tizacaptor, and Ivacaptor, uh, standard dose is in green up there, and then the standard dose with the rifibutin uh, is in red. And what she found is that uh, the co-administration together still maintained concentrations above uh, the EC50 and EC90 values for ETI, uh, as outlined in the FDA briefing documents. Uh, but we wanted to validate these preliminary uh, PPPK simulations with real-world uh, clinical data, and so that's uh, where my project comes in. So we conducted uh, at USC a prospective single-arm clinical study to evaluate the pharmacokinetics of ETI alone, uh, and then also with rifeputin and healthy volunteers. So our objectives were twofold. First, we wanted to characterize just first rifibutin's impact on ETI pharmacokinetics, and then we also wanted to evaluate uh, various dosing strategies. One for bioequivalence of the uh, with ETI alone versus with rifibutin, and then we also wanted to assess the effectivity of standard dosing, um, as mentioned before. Uh, we had six healthy volunteers participate in the trial. Uh, first, they received a single oral dose of ETI, so one orange tablet. Uh, they, they then had a three to four day washout period. They took two weeks of rifibutin, uh, standard dose, 300 milligrams. Uh, this is to reach steady state levels, and then they were given another single orange ETI pill. Uh, we collected blood samples from zero to 72 hours uh, to perform pharmacokinetic analysis. Uh, the plasma concentrations of ETI and also their major metabolites were analyzed via uh, LCMS-MS. Uh, and then I conducted a non-compartmental analysis to estimate first the pharmacokinetic parameters and confirm this in vivo interaction. Uh, and then we fit the concentration time data to a compartmental model and then used a population modeling 
and Monte Carlo simulations to simulate a variety of different dosing strategies in a uh, simulated larger population. Uh, so first, again, we evaluated the ETI dosing adjustment with rifibutin to assess, achieve bioequivalence, uh, and then we also simulated standard dosing with rifibutin to assess the feasibility of using it in this context. Uh, so here are some of the concentration time graphs from our study. Uh, so ETI alone is in red, and then ETI with rifibutin is in blue. So we did see uh, generally decreases in the Cmax, or maximum plasma concentration, uh, as well as the AUC, so the overall drug exposure for Alexacaptor, Tazacaptor, and Ivacaptor. Uh, this is consistent with rifibutin's CYP3A induction, so it's, it's what we expected. Um, we also saw increases in the clearance rates consistent with induction of CYP3A4, uh, and then resulting decreases in the half-life. Um, we did assess the safety of this in healthy volunteers. Um, we did have some pretty significant side effects. Um, leukopenia, or low white blood cell counts, were found in uh, five out of six of our subjects, and then moderate to severe neutropenia found in three, uh, and then one other patient experienced flu-like symptoms, a couple with fatigue. Um, so monitoring for these effects, uh, using rifibutin in people with CF is, is definitely uh, very important. Um, these effects are usually not seen when rifibutin is used with an active infection, um, as white blood cell counts are usually elevated during this time uh, anyway. Uh, we also wanted to compare the reduction in the AUC with standard dose ETI and then ETI with rifibutin. So that is the bar graph on the left. We saw about a 50% reduction in the uh, Alexacaptor AUC and then about 29% reductions in the Tezacaptor and Ivacaptor AUCs. Um, as you can see in the dark blue on the right, um, that is the ivacaptor with rifampin, which had an 89% reduction. So this really demonstrates that rifibutin's induction potential is much less than uh, rifampin's. And in the table, uh, we wanted to compare the uh, Dr. Hong's PBPK predicted uh, AUC decreases uh, in comparison to the, what we observed. Um, Ivacaftor is usually the most sensitive CYP3A4 substrate, um, but we did see that it didn't have as much of a decrease in the AUC as expected. Uh, we did have a relatively small sample size, so we think that with a larger population, uh, a little bit uh, more decreases would have been seen there. Uh, another concern is that uh, increased enzyme induction could increase uh, active metabolite concentrations, and then this could also raise toxicity concerns. So the major metabolites of ET and I uh, are still active in the same way as their parent compound. Uh, however, we didn't find any significant changes in major active metabolites uh, for ETI. Uh, one possible explanation of this is that the active metabolites, uh, so M23 Lexicaptor, M1 Tezacaptor, and M1 Ivacaptor, may have been further metabolized uh, more rapidly by CYP3A into inactive forms. So that's not as much of a concern uh, as initially thought. Um, I then wanted to share my population dosing simulations. So this is first the dosing simulations to find a bioequivalent dose of ETI alone in comparison to the dose we would need of ETI uh, with rifibutin. Uh, and what we found was that uh, two orange tablets in the morning and then two orange tablets and one blue tablet in the evening would achieve this bioequivalent dose. Uh, and this is a much, although it's an elevated dose, uh, it's not as much as our preliminary in silico simulations would have suggested. Um, as previously mentioned though, insurance is, can be very difficult. Uh, again, likely still not covered, even though it's only a modest uh, dose increase. And so we did also assess standard ETI dosing with rifibutin. And what we found uh, is great. Uh, standard ETI dosing, so the trough concentrations of each drug, Alexacaptor, Tazacaptor, and Ivacaptor, uh, are expected to mostly exceed uh, these EC50 and also EC90 targets. Um, the only exception is Tezacaptor dipped below the EC50 for about four hours before the next uh, dosing interval. Uh, this is also consistent uh, with our prior PPPK modeling. Uh, we also had a case series of three patient cases uh, that received the standard dose rifibutin with ETI or ivacaptor monotherapy, uh, and all three patients were successful in this dosing uh, and indicated stable pulmonary function in sweat chloride. So this further uh, indicates that standard ETI dosing might actually be viable with rifibutin despite its contraindication. Uh, just as far as our conclusions. Uh, so first, obviously, rifibutin alters the pharmacokinetics of ETI, uh, although significantly less than rifampin. 
Uh, standard dose ETI is recommended for most patients, uh, though if practitioners did want to achieve bioequivalence, a higher dose uh, might be required. Um, and this bioequivalent dose is two orange tablets in the morning and then two orange tablets and one blue tablet in the evening. Uh, and these studies, uh, or these results definitely indicate that further studies investigating the efficacy and safety of ETI with rifabutin, uh, so more clinical trials, more clinical studies, uh, are definitely warranted to see if we can actually start using this antibiotic uh, and getting people with CF the treatment for NTMPD that they deserve. So with that, uh, I wanted to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Paul Berenger, uh, as well as Dr. Peter Chung and Dr. Adupa Rao, uh, both practitioners in the USC CF clinic, uh, as well as all of uh, my lab members. Uh, Dr. Anjan Hong, again, is a professor now at CHA University in South Korea, and did a lot of the preliminary uh, PPPK simulation work. Uh, and then I wanted to thank the CF Foundation for their funding. And with that, if you have any questions, <laughs> your hands out <right> after. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. That's a great clinical question. We have a huge problem with NTM in Florida, so we're always trying to figure out what to do um, with our patients. All right, our next speaker is going to be Sabrina Sherwood. You see, I'm trying to like multitask here and introduce her and bring up her slides. <laughs> um, Sabrina is a pharmacist at the Cystic Fibrosis Center of Idaho. She completed her training at Idaho State University and residency training at University of Utah. And in her free time, she loves to spend time with her two dogs in the Idaho mountains. She is going to be talking to us today about exploring clinical practices regarding highly effective modulator therapy in pregnancy and postnatal care. Welcome, Sabrina. Hey everyone, good morning. Thanks for being here with us. Um, I guess before we get started, how many of you heard my talk yesterday about reproductive health? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, wow, hi friends, you're back. So I must not have like scared you too much or like really annoyed you with my jokes. I'm not gonna promise the same level of jokes today, but I did save a few. So anyway, I have no disclosures. And kind of starting at where we started last time. So um, today we're going to talk about not only this idea of reproductive health and how pharmacy members, uh, pharmacy team members and other team members can help in that setting, uh, but we're also going to have a tangible takeaway because really my goal for this conference for everybody here is to have some sort of impact of, on this idea of reproductive health and how um, highly effective modulators can impact mother's health, baby's health. Um, and so we're gonna dive into that. But first of all, I just wanna express why this is something that we should all care about. And the reason is this graph, which I know you've all seen a hundred times, um, but just kind of emphasizing this idea that the trichafta baby boom is real. And you know, it's really not, our fault that like we've been a little bit behind on coming out with guidance and education on how to manage moms um, who get pregnant while they're on highly effective modulator therapy, but we do need to catch up and get some things done. You heard me talk yesterday a little bit about this idea of a mother and child centered care team. I feel really strongly that we all have a part to play in making sure that the health of the mother um, and baby is surrounded by a core team. And the idea of communication between the members on this slide um, is really important to think about because how many, how many of you guys have had a mom who's on a highly effective modulator therapy that gets pregnant? Show of hands, okay, yeah. And the question that we're gonna answer today is how do we make sure that mom feels supported, not just from our care team, but from her OBGYN, pediatrician, and primary care provider, right? So if you saw my talk, you probably saw Elise talk at the end of the talk yesterday. And you know, I thought it was really great that she felt like she was supported from all the different care team members that she had um, because it sounded like her EMR system was set up so that all of her providers are seeing the notes. So she felt like, okay, everybody knows what's going on in my pregnancy. If I need to stop a medication, I can do that um, because they've all talked about it, right? Um, but unfortunately in other states, especially like in my state where we have a lot of uh, clinicians that are in smaller towns, that's not reality. And that might not be the reality for other people here in the room today. So how can we bridge that communication gap? And that's what we're gonna talk about. 
So uh, the survey that I'm going to present to you um, is called Exploring Clinical Practices Regarding Highly Effective Modulator Therapy. I'll refer to that as HEMT in pregnancy and postnatal care um, with cystic fibrosis. This was a survey that we did and um, it's poster 498. If you have specific questions because it was a pretty long survey, um, stop by after, it's right after this and uh, Maddie Hill will be presenting on it and she's great. I won't bore you to death, but I hope I've kind of shown you why it's important that we look at this topic. We have the Trikafta baby boom, and the CFF is supporting us with this mission. Um, they have recognized that they need to come out with guidance to help moms and help care teams understand how they can best take care of their infant during pregnancy and after. And so uh, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the CF Farm team who was kind of tasked with this idea of let's bring all these really smart people together and um, try to create something out of it. And so um, Kevin and I actually run the CF Farm Reproductive Health subgroup. And from that subgroup, we came out with this idea of a survey because we recognized that there might be a need for something to get some more education and coordination around HEMT use um, in utero and postnatally. So um, I also will just put that shout out once again. If you're interested in the CF Farm group um, or the Reproductive Health subgroup, please email me. I've gotten a few emails already, so I love that. Um, please do that. So diving in a little bit into the survey methods and results. So um, this was a survey that we did across the US uh, we ended up getting about 66 centers that were involved and we polled all kinds of people because really our intention was let's get every single person on the care team to get involved in this and get their idea because we know that you know if the pharmacist has one idea of how to manage mom during pregnancy or afterward um, that might not be the same as how the physician would handle it or a nurse so um, we wanted to to poll everyone here. Okay, and then not surprisingly, most of the people really uh, supported the idea of let's recommend continuing HEMT in pregnancy and lactation. Um, that wasn't, that was really nothing surprising there. Um, although I would like to just take the second to say that one thing I was super proud of with this uh, survey was that everybody really emphasized the importance of having shared decision making with mom. So throughout this, you'll see a few numbers and maybe some of them will shock you, but um, the idea here is that it was all with the caveat of, okay, this is after a decision was made with mom and the care team, so um, none of this is like set in stone, like we would do this. Um, I polled a lot of people yesterday and I think this number is pretty accurate. Um, what we're finding is that not a lot of people have a defined educational process regarding HEMT in this during pregnancy and after pregnancy era. Um, and so what we did find was that the vast majority of you guys are having some kind of informal conversation with mom. And um, when you're doing this, it might be that first visit after you find out she's pregnant, or it might be that first visit after birth if you're specifically gonna educate about lactation. Um, but no one, I mean, not no one, but a lot of people are not having any kind of like formal standardized process for how they're educating moms about the risks of HEMT use in pregnancy, or um, maybe even like how they should manage those risks. And if something goes wrong, what do they do? And we'll kind of dive into that. And then what I, I, we also asked, what kind of education are you providing if you do? And although it's informal, a lot of people mentioned that they do give some current evidence for use of HEMT in pregnancy and lactation. They do talk about how HEMT is present in the breast milk, and they do talk about the side effects of, or the um, possible adverse effects of administering HEMT during pregnancy or lactation to the infant. Then we asked, okay, well, what are you gonna do once infant is born and mom is still breastfeeding and mom's taking a modulator, right? Because we know, and I didn't wanna bore you guys once again with this, but we know that Trichapta is present in the breast milk, but we don't always know how that's gonna affect baby. There are a lot of reasons why baby should be kind of looked at a little bit more closely during that time period where they are being exposed to a highly effective modulator therapy, but what do people look at? Um, so the majority of people said that they are getting cataract monitoring and liver monitoring in infants that are exposed to therapy. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that we asked 
when do you do this monitoring? Because we think it's really important to kind of identify, you know, what's that, what's that sweet spot? When's the time period? And it kind of depended. Um, for eyes, they did recommend checking within about three months of birth. If they did find cataracts, we asked, well, what do you do about that? And I thought this is really interesting. About a quarter of people said they would stop the breastfeeding. Um, but most responses said that it would be a shared decision. Um, so that's really interesting because I think when, you know, we think about cataracts, um, we have to be really careful about what are we going to do with that. It depends if the baby has CF versus not, right? So um, these things are all nuanced. So if you have questions about it, come find us after. And then for liver, uh, most people recommended checking liver monitoring labs within zero to three months. And if they did find abnormalities, the majority of people said that instead of just stopping breast milk, um, they would do some kind of supplemental breast milk and formula um, feeding so that baby can still get the benefits of breast milk, but um, maybe gets exposed less to highly effective modulator therapy, which could be affecting their liver labs. So I thought that was really super interesting as well. Okay, so we've talked about kind of the liver function and the cataracts and just to give you a little bit idea as to why that's important, we talked about this yesterday, so I'll kind of go through it, but this idea of the CYP3A4 system, and we just heard more about that. But the interesting thing to know is that in infants, they actually don't develop their CYP3A4 system fully until about one to two years of life. And so it's really important that we consider that. Um, and I'm going to make a really corny joke, but like, let's keep an eye on them, right? Because they might have increased risk of adverse effects, specifically as it relates to cataracts, which we know can be um, an issue in highly effective modulator therapy and liver function, which we test for in everyone. All right, so continuing on here, um, we talked a little bit about when we would conduct kind of that idea of when are we going to check those labs. And just to give you the statistic here, 94% agreed with that. And then here's the really interesting part, and this is the takeaway. I mean, whenever I give a talk, I really just want you guys to all take away just one thing, just literally write down one thing. Um, and if it's anything, it's this idea that we found a huge discrepancy in communication. So we found that most participants defer the management of an infant monitoring to non-CF providers, but only half report having communications with these outside providers. So let me give you a situation here, right? So you have a mom, she has CF, she calls you, I'm pregnant. You get her through the whole pregnancy. She has a baby. You see her in the clinic maybe like one month after she gives birth or maybe you see them sooner. Are you having a conversation with her about how the infant's doing? Is the infant being monitored, right? So in a lot of settings, we're kind of forgetting like, okay, you had a baby, we're gonna take care of you now. We're not gonna think about really what's going on with the infant that it might still be getting exposed to highly effective modulator therapy. Um, and so it's really important that we think about how are we going to best support mom in this role and not let that communication gap suffer. So takeaways, um, just wanted to highlight that idea that there is this huge gap in communication that we found throughout the survey, and I'd love to talk about it more with you guys. Um, I would love for you each to kind of just take one key takeaway from this, and um, if I had to guess, I would just... Think about how you might be able to communicate with either a pediatrician or maybe you have uh, MFM or OBGYN or PCP communications. And if you need more ideas of how to do that, I'm offering to give you all um, a free kind of like, this is what the risks are of highly effective modulator therapy. Um, uh, on the infant and you can give this piece of paper to your mom who has just delivered or before they deliver. And um, if you wanna do that, send me an email and we can kind of, I can talk you through it then, um, but I'm happy to send that to you. So again, would just love you all to take away one thing and hopefully it's something about communication. I know this talk was not as heavy on you know, technical things, but I think it's really important that we're thinking about how the pharmacist or someone else on the care team can make an impact on communication. Thank you. Thanks so much for that talk. I like some talks that are practical.
it does give my brain a little bit of break from a lot of the technical things. But um, I remember having my first CF pregnancy not long after Trikafta came out. And I was like, oh crap, what do I do? Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how far we've come uh, from track after pregnancy since 2019 even um, of the data that we have and what we have to support and and what we have to kind of help our parents make informed decisions uh, even more so now than we had in 2019. So this does add a little bit more to that and I'm thankful for your presentation today. Um, so, we will continue forward with our final presenter for this session. This is Carissa Cam. Uh, Carissa is a pediatric pulmonary clinical pharmacist practitioner at the University of North Carolina Medical Center on Chapel Hill, primarily caring for pediatric uh, CF and lung transplant patients. She received her PharmD from UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy in 2014 and completed PGY1 and PGY2 residency training at Texas Children's in Houston, Texas. Welcome to the stage correctly supporting her Carolina Blue. <laughs> Thank you. For, Thank you for that introduction. Um, and so this project was a, a project from the sub subgroup of the CF farm. Um, and so we did a um, survey to providers uh, regarding management strategies of hepatotoxicity associated with ETI. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, so we all know that um, Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, ETI has been revolutionary for patients who are eligible and who tolerate. Um, however, all three components are hepatically metabolized, and we do know that 10 to 11 percent of patients do experience some sort of LFT elevations um, on ETI. Um, the package insert does provide some guidance with regards to um, uh, hepatic uh, dose adjustments or when to uh, pause therapy. So for example, there are thresholds for holding ETI, um, such as if your AST, ALT are above the five times upper limit of normal, or if you have a combined AST, ALT elevation of greater than three times upper, upper limit of normal, as well as um, bilirubin being um, over two times the upper limit of normal. They also, as um, almost Dr. Shi had uh, noted, um, some um, dosing recommendations for uh, mild hepatic impairment. However, as we know as clinicians, there's a lot of clinically gray scenarios. Um, for example, if you have a patient who has AST, ALT elevations in the three to four time upper limit of normal range, but without the concomitant two time upper limit of normal range um, for your bilirubin, or what about patients with underlying CF liver disease, or if they don't meet the child puke um, criteria, what do you do? Um, so, um, the members of the sub subgroup of CF Farm, um, we know that at our 10 various centers, everybody's practice like widely varies. So the purpose of this survey was to better characterize current ETI management strategies across um, accredited CF centers in the U.S. Um, so as I talk about results, this not necessarily our these are nece not necessarily our recommendations, but just what is happening across the country. So in February and March of this year, um, a three-part 31-question survey delineating various clinical scenarios was distributed to the CF Foundation's pharmacy and pharmacist, pharmacist and pharmacy technician, um, CF center director, and digest listservs. Um, it was a three-part survey. So the bulk of the survey was part one, which is um, delineating management of VTI in people with CF um, with baseline normal LFTs. Um, and so the various points we'll go through as we go through the results um, are listed on the right. The second portion was for patients um, who at baseline already had some abnormal LFTs or had baseline CF liver disease. And then the third portion was regarding approaches, um, CF center approaches towards GI hepatology workup and referral. Um, so 31 questions, it's a lot of data, so buckle up um, and we'll see how much we can get through with this. So we had a very robust response. We had 53 different responders um, and a really nice mix of CF providers as well as CF pharmacists. I'll also highlight that we had five gastroenterologists and hepatologists that responded as well. While we would have loved more, um, it's great to also have their expertise um, included in here. And there was also a really nice mix of um, patient type uh, or patient population that was seen. Um, and so with adults and pediatric providers represented as well. And then the vast majority of the respondents came from probably medium-sized CF centers, so between 100 to 250 patients. 
Um, so before we jump into part one, one of the first questions that was also asked, as we mentioned just now, the package insert does have recommendations based off of upper limit of normal. However, the question is, what is our actual normal range? Um, as we all know, lab references can vary widely. Um, so from this question, 76% of respondents um, selected that they utilize the reference range specified by the laboratory where the specimen was drawn to define their um, normal limits of LFT. However, I will point out that 15% also selected generally accepted reference ranges based on the patient's age and sex, um, even if it does not align with the lab's reference range. Um, so some of the references that were um, highlighted from those respondents were Harriet Lane, the ACG guidelines, as well as the Caliper database. Um, and then if you looked at, uh, based on provider type, you can see that even our GI, our five GI hepatology colleagues um, also were divided on this. Um, but it is important to note, um, I will um, point out that during yesterday's Physician Grand Rounds, Dr. Sellers noted, especially for pediatric patients, it is really important that we take into consideration um, the patient's um, age and sex because that um, normal reference range really can impact our normal reference ranges and our thresholds. So moving to part one, so management of ETI in people with baseline normal LFTs. So the first question is probably this, um, the scenario that we often see. Um, so if you have a patient who has some transaminase elevations, but they don't meet package insert thresholds for holding, what do you do? Um, so this was a multi-select answer. So there were 71 total responses. Um, and um, you'll notice that the vast majority selected no change in ETI therapy. Um, but a lot of people, 64% um, selected two interventions or two options and the most common combination being no change in ETI, but repeating LFTs. So the, of the individuals who also selected repeating LFTs, 57% would repeat within two to four weeks. Um, additionally, for the small uh, proportion that would empirically dose reduce ETI, 50% uh, would stop the evening ivacaftor dose only. Um, as we also know, um, LFT elevations can also be attributed to multiple other causes. It might not just be from ETI. Um, and so when posed the question of if the elevations could be attributed to some other cause like viral illness or other medications, um, uh, excuse me, 61% of um, respondents um, did note that they would, um, that would impact when they would repeat LFTs. Um, and that's uh, represented on the bar graph on the left for, um, with everybody. Um, and then it's further broken down by uh, patient population type served. Um, and then of those who would repeat LFTs, 63% would repeat LFTs within one to three months. Then the next three questions that we're going to talk about um, are related to the clinical scenario of if you do have to pause ETI therapy um, based off of either package insert recommendation thresholds or clinically significant elevations. Um, so the first question was, um, what, at what time point would you recommend repeating labs? So almost half would repeat labs at uh, one month. But as you can see, there also are several, um, another significant proportion that would check sooner than that. Um, it also was interesting when you break down based on population type served um, and their responses, the adult providers tended to check sooner actually, so two weeks, as opposed to those um, who cared for pediatric patients tended to wait a little bit longer, maybe about one month. Um, and then if you look at uh, the different provider types, the pharmacists were more split between two weeks to a month um, versus the non-pharmacy providers um, at about one month. So same scenario, if you're pausing and repeating, then it begs the question, when do you restart? Um, and so you'll see in the blue, 42% um, tended to resume once LFTs returned to their pre-ETI baseline, but there still was a group of folks, 39%, that would resume um, so long as LFTs had decreased to less than two times the upper limit of normal, and some had even higher tolerance, um, all at least downtrending and less, to five, less than five times the upper load of, limit of normal. Um, I will note that there were a lot of comments that the ideal scenario would be to get closer to your pre-ETI baseline, um, but if there were clinical urgency um, or they are stuck, um, then they would still go ahead and proceed with reinitiating ETI. 
So then the last question related to this scenario would be, okay, if you're gonna restart, what dose are we restarting at? Um, what are people doing? So a third, um, so 19 respondents, um, do resume at full dose based off of age and weight, um, but two thirds restart at some sort of modified dose. And as you can see, the type of dosing is highly varied. Um, kind of not surprising, um, but 67% again would restart at a lower dose. All right, so switching now um, to the opposite direction, maybe the more optimal uh, scenario where your patient has been on ETI for a year um, and they had no um, elevations in their quarterly LFTs. So how frequently um, do providers check LFTs beyond the first year? So here we have a little bit more consensus. So 94% do repeat LFTs annually, which, which does align with the package insert recommendations. Um, however, if um, patients did have some elevations, uh, but less than five times upper limit of normal and never paused ETI therapy, um, we asked providers how, frequent, how frequently would they check LFTs beyond that first year. And about half said annual with their um, typical CF annual labs. However, again, almost half um, would repeat a little bit more frequently between three to six months. Um, and then if you look at responses based off of provider type, um, in the um, green bars you see pharmacists tended to lean more towards the annual checks um, versus the um, non-pharmacy providers were split between the every six months and annually. Um, and then um, in our 10 different centers, um, there have been um, instances where we've seen isolated hyperbilirubinemia, which may be explained by Alexacafter also being a PGP substrate. Um, so we asked providers um, how do they respond to incidences of isolated hyperbilirubinemia in their patients. This also was a multi-select option, but you'll see that 48% of respondents um, selected a combination of continuing ETI with or without more frequent LFT monitoring and also so referring to our GI hepatology colleagues. Um, and then when you're looking at um, a breakdown of provider types based on GI hepatology provider or not, um, not surprisingly, you'll see our GI colleagues, thankfully, are much more comfortable with our um, workup for Jill Bears in these types of situations. I think we've all been faced with the question before of when or if we should restart ETI um, in patients or are there scenarios where we wouldn't? Um, so question 15 was regarding were there any situations where you would be unwilling to rechallenge a patient even at a modified dose? And so in the blue, you can see that 42% of respondents said if their patients had elevations in LFTs plus other systemic symptoms of acute hepatotoxicity um, they, and there was no other identifiable cause, that would be a reason for them to not rechallenge with ETI, as well as rapid onset of transaminitis greater, to, greater than five times upper limit of normal. Um, so again, that's a total of about 67% where there were some situations where they would not re-challenge. Um, so then shifting gears a little bit, as we know, a lot of patients um, are not modulator naive. So um, especially with ETI when it came out, um, some of our patients had pretty stable LFTs on their prior modulator. Um, so this first question was asking providers if they would resume quarterly LFT checks when switching to a novel modulator. And we did have 100% consensus here. Everybody would repeat LFTs um, quarterly, at least for the first year. Now for the more um, gray scenario of if a patient needs to switch back to a previously tolerated modulator due to adverse effects, would they resume um, quarterly LFT monitoring for that first year going back to the previously tolerated modulator? So 42% 40, uh, would not resume the quarterly checks, 41% um, would, um, but there was another subset that said maybe they would check a little bit more frequently and then space. Um, and then this was specific to the pediatric providers. Um, as you all know, pediatric dosing of the modulators is age-based and weight-based. Um, so it is quite possible for a pediatric patient to be stable on their dose, have liver, um, normal liver function tests um, be on it for at least a year, um, but then they might hit a dose adjustment based off of their age or their weight. Um, so this was asking pediatric providers if they have to dose adjust up based off of those parameters, if they recheck LFTs soon than your standard um, yearly checks. So 75% of providers said no, they do not um, when they have those dose adjustments. 
All right, moving to part two. So this is um, people with CF with ab baseline abnormal LFTs or pre-existing CF liver disease. All right, so the first question um, in this section was in patients who have known CF liver disease or baseline um, abnorm abnormalities, but they do not meet the child pew classification for class B or C, which we know a lot of our CF patients uh, don't, even though they do have um, pre-existing CF liver disease. Um, do you empirically start on an adjusted dose? Um, so 74% 74 of the respondents actually do not start on an adjusted dose, which I did find um, interesting, but certainly we know um, that can really span a huge spectrum um, of CF liver disease. Um, of the 14 respondents, though, that did empirically start on an adjusted dose, you'll see that about half um, did select either um, full dose triple combination or a modified triple combination um, of that form um, to start with, um, versus 36% in the blue started with the manufacturer's dosing recommendations for child class PUB. Um, and then if you look at responses by provider type, again, the caveat being this is very small numbers, um, You'll see that the pharmacists um, in green um, tended to um, select a dosing based off of a modified dose of the triple combination only um, versus um, your non-pharmacy providers um, tended to um, do either the triple combination at a modified dose or the manufacturer um, child pew class B dosing. Um, and then questions 22 to 23, which are not listed on here, they ask these providers, um, since they started at a lower dose, do they up titrate further and to what dose? And so 93% of those respondents would continue to up titrate that dose to the maximal tolerated dose by the patient. Um, so then we've started the, the medication, then when do we obtain our first LFT check? So about half reported um, checking LFTs for the first time at four weeks, but you'll also notice that about 30% of respondents would check earlier than four weeks, um, some as soon as one week. Um, and then how frequently are people checking LFTs during that first year? Are they waiting for the three months um, as per the package insert or sooner? Um, so actually 58% still um, check every three months um, per the package insert. But again, 38% of respondents also would check more frequently than three months. Um, so anywhere between one to three months uh, to monthly or more frequently in then space. Um, so then beyond the first year of therapy, so presuming these patients tolerated from a liver function test, um, how frequently would you um, repeat LFTs um, beyond that first year? Um, and so the vast majority, actually 74%, would um, continue more frequent LFT monitoring as opposed to just the annual checks. Um, and I'll note that all five of the GI hepatologists also recommended um, frequent monitoring between that three to six month range. And then finally, for an even more nuanced clinical scenario, so we have some patients, right, who already at baseline, their LFTs are already at that two to three time upper limit of normal range. Um, and so if we are starting ETI and they experience um, elevations, you don't really have all that much room to go in terms of um, until you hit five times upper limit of normal. So this question was um, surveying providers to see what their threshold was. So 69% of um, respondents said that they still would use the um, LFTs at greater than five times the upper limit of normal as their threshold for either pausing or dose adjusting ETI. One other thing that was interesting when comparing um, patient population served, the pediatric providers actually tended to select two to three times the patient's baseline LFTs more frequently, so at 74% um, compared to our adult providers. All right, we're in the home stretch. Last uh, portion, so CF centers approaches towards um, GI hepatology workup and referral. Um, especially in light of the new um, CF Foundation um, hepatology recommendations. Um, this question was also multi-select um, in asking about how liver imaging, especially abnormal findings without a concomitant um, abnormality, uh, without concomitant abnormalities in LFTs, how does that affect practice, especially related to medication dosing? And you'll see that 53% do not change anything um, with medication dosing, but there is um, a proportion, 13%, that would hepatically adjust all medications. I did find it was interesting that the five GI providers were pretty much equally split about whether or not you would um, or should um, change, uh, make any dosage adjustments based off of that. 
You'll also see that 17% of responders also said that they would initiate ursodial, even though that's not recommended in the guidelines. Um, and all of those were non-GI providers um, that had noted that piece. Um, then the last two questions are with regards to referring to our GI hepatology colleagues. Um, so this was more of a free response type question. Um, so what criteria or scenarios warrant a referral to the GI hepatology team from your CF uh, from your CF care team? So by far the most common theme was having persistently elevated LFTs, especially if you've tried pausing ETI or dose reducing, um, as well as finding um, abnormal imaging, as well as if a patient was having symptomatic signs of hepatotoxicity. Um, and then looking at if the CF care team um, would get additional imaging or lab results prior to the patient going over to GI hepatology, 54% selected yes, that they would conduct additional testing. And with regards to what type of additional workup, um, the most common answer was um, additional hepatitis panel workup, um, as well as imaging like liver ultrasound, um, some additional LFT monitoring, um, PTINR. But there also was a good number of people who said none or they weren't sure or they would kind of wait for a GI's uh, direction with regards to that. So after all of that, clear as mud, right? Um, what can we conclude from this? Um, I think, um, Unsurprisingly, uh, practices across the country are very varied, and I think this really highlights the complexity of the patient um, scenarios that we are um, we, that we are facing, as well as the individualized approach that many centers take. Um, additionally, in certain scenarios, there are varied approaches based on provider type and patient population served. However, if we're trying to look for some common theme themes, I think a consistent trend is that if possible, um, providers are trying to maintain patients on therapy um, at the highest dose tolerated. Um, and while approaches to dose adjustments have also, very, um, have also varied widely, it does seem like most providers are trying to um, emphasize um, and maintain that triple combination, so your orange pills or your triple combination granules um, over the ivacaftor only. Um, and then also while most perform more frequent LFT monitoring in response to LFT elevations or in uh, the patient populations with underlying liver disease and uh, that is kind of that common theme to check more frequently. However, that cadence is highly variable. There were a few areas of consensus, um, including um, annual checks for patients who previously toler uh, who tolerated that first year, um, maybe a little bit more caution and retrialing and challenging um, patients if they had symptomatic symptoms of he hepatotoxicity. Um, and then um, when changing to a novel modulator, we restart um, our LFT checks uh, for that first year. Um, makes sense as we're introducing new medications and then involving our GI hepatology colleagues probably sooner rather than later. Um, but I think with the um, varied responses, I think this highlights another opportunity potentially for a multidisciplinary guideline to be created to help clinicians navigate these really clinically challenging scenarios. So with that, again, a huge shout out again to the sub subgroup of CF Farm. Um, and you guys can swing by our poster as well later today. Thank you. All right. So this concludes the, the formal presentation portion of our programming today. But if you have questions, I would like to invite our speakers up to the, to the front here so we have microphones available for them. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the app yet. Um, so if you have questions, you're, if you're a loud human, you're welcome to speak from where you're sitting. If you are not a loud human, we would ask that you probably might use the mic so that we can hear. I was looking ahead. There were questions. Oh, we do have questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is for Hillary. So Hillary, were the majority of patients using one pharmacy, um, were they using the, your institutional specialty pharmacy or a, a institutional specialty pharmacy? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. And I wish I would have highlighted that more um, during the presentation. So the majority of people who were using just one pharmacy to fill their Plumazyme and other CF medications were using our institutional um, specialty pharmacy with Indiana University Health. People who are in the multiple pharmacy group could have still been using our pharmacy as one of their pharmacies, but then had another, typically a national specialty pharmacy to fill their Pulmazyme. Because um, the trend that we see is that people are able to get, well, 
Currently, um, people are able to get their CFTR modulator from our hospital specialty pharmacy um, and have to get their Pulmazyme through another contracted pharmacy. That's going to be changing, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, the, the, the other thing I want to say about that is like the most commonly con uh, concurrent medication that was prescribed with Pulmazyme was actually hypertonic saline, which is not a specialty pharmacy. And many of those national specialty pharmacies will not dispense hypertonic saline. So um, that automatically gives patients two different pharmacies oftentimes in order to get their Pulmazyme and their hypertonic saline. Okay, the next question is for Madeline. Um, do you know if anyone's looking at using like 3A4 inhibitors to, you know, counter the effects of the 3A4 inducers? Uh, yeah, that's actually, that's a great question. Um, I do not know of anybody that's actively using it. I think while in theory using an inhibitor to kind of counteract Rifabutin's induction effect, uh, in theory would work, but I think that adding another drug into the mix is just generally not a great idea. Uh, it would create kind of what we call a complex drug-drug interaction. Um, there's already significant patient variability with metas metabolism of ETI. I feel like that's been a general consensus throughout a lot of the talks that we've seen over the last couple of days. Um, there's also uh, patient variability in metabolism of Rifebutin, and then adding in another inhibitor, I think that it would just make uh, add much more unpredictability into the mix. So I would not recommend that, yeah. What about something like grapefruit juice? You know, that's not a medication, but maybe like a, <laughs> also a problem. That, that could be a good idea, but I think, yeah, you definitely like would need more studies with that. But I also don't think grapefruit juice is recommended with a lot of the other medications that, that people with CF are generally taking either, so, yeah. Okay. And I specifically had a question too. Do you know anybody that, uh, like, did you come across any personalization of like rifabutin dosing based on like therapeutic drug monitoring? So maybe we don't need to change the ETI dose. Maybe we could alter the rifabutin dose. Yeah, I think that uh, I, I don't believe that it's been done so far because prescribers, because of this contraindication, are so hesitant and without these studies that we've been doing, so hesitant and have not been prescribing it uh, as an antibiotic. But I definitely think that an observational study and therapeutic drug monitoring would definitely be beneficial for use of rifabutin in this population. Thank you. Feel free to. It's okay. Feel free to. Yeah. Um, it's for me to chime in on that, we have had one or two patients where we have continued um, ETI as well as rifabutin, and at our particular center, because we know CF patients have altered PKPD, even though it's not recommended in the guidelines, we still go ahead and get um, rifabutin or rifamycin levels as well as the thambutol and the macrolide levels. Um, so we still shoot for the goal peaks for rifabutin, um, but. Um, it's nice to now have data that even with our standard dosing of ETI that we still can at least hit that EC50. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that as well. We had tried a, um, pausing ETI for one of my MAC patients recently and although she improved, we still could not quite get her back to her baseline. And then we made that switch from um, restarting the uh, restarting ETI and then using rifabutin and she's now back to her like 110 FEV1. So. Chris, so the next question's for you. So, <laughs> um, what approaches or strategies have you seen to using ETI in patients post liver transplant? Post liver transplant, I think a lot of that is um, good communication with the liver transplant team. Um, I think generally, my understanding is that folks have recommended um, after the immediate post-op period, going ahead and restarting ETI. Um, some, I believe, have started at a lower dose and then up titrated to the full dose. Um, again, may, primarily um, trying to maintain that lung function. But if you've not had a lot of um, post-liver transplant complications, I think it's reasonable. You have a brand new liver, should be able to um, process that ETI. Don't know if other folks have other experiences, though. I have not particularly been in that situation, though. Anybody want to add? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, we have one patient, a young man who is liver transplanted and uh, he's also on warfarin due to repeated uh, deep vein thrombosis. Um, and he, uh, we, so we titrated the ETI carefully in him, uh, started careful dosing, and now he's uh, on two morning tablets every day and no evening tablet, and it's working fine. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Just to add, uh, 
quite a few um, post -tran post liver transplant CFL um, CF liver disease patients. And so what we do is we pair it with the TACRA levels that are doing um, after transplant. So weekly, we restart ETI once they are um, once they're discharged, uh, then from the transplant admission, and then we're doing weekly LFTs for the first month. And then as long as that's stable, then we space to monthly. Um, and it, again, just and it goes with the TACRA monitoring from there. That's a good idea, so you're not adding more um, monitoring because you're already monitoring the tachrodosis. And there was one more question for um, Carissa. Um, so if you have someone that's been on a lower dose for over a year and they don't change drugs but like increase back up, do you have any idea on the consensus of LFT monitoring frequency after that? I don't think we asked that question, uh, but I think if it's probably highly dependent on the patient's history of how high their elevations were previously, I think it would be prudent probably to at least do one check earlier um, or maybe do two checks and then space if it seems like that they're tolerating. Okay, the next question is for Sabrina. How much support do you think adult CF centers in particular should help um, provide um, moms information and like a list of providers for infant lab draws and ophthalmology? Um, this person said, I can imagine it would be stressful for moms to have to navigate that themselves. And so would you recommend it, having a detailed plan before birth or you know after? Yeah, I love this question. So thank you to whoever asked it. Um, I feel really passionately about this question because I think what we found is that when we assume that somebody else is gonna take on the responsibility, it just doesn't get done. And so the only one suffering is mom and baby, right? So I do think that we should take on the responsibility as the CF care team, um, at least enough to provide education in a more standardized approach than we do currently. Um, so I would encourage everybody here to, if they have the time and passion, please like take on that, that work it's not going to be a lot right like we don't have a ton of patients who get pregnant and are on modulator and have a baby but it's increasing and so i think it's worth putting in some time to develop like a handout um or something of that sort to educate mom and then if you can like bonus points follow up with the pediatrician i have some friends that will actually like call the pediatrician um, of the infant with mom's permission and discuss all of this over phone with them too some people are lucky enough to have emrs that all communicate as well uh, so just figure out what works for you guys but i would encourage you to kind of take on that lead role Okay, and as a follow-up, there's another question about like, how do you typically deliver the letter that you presented with the monitoring recommendations? And like, do you follow, do you, do you see if it's followed through? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of comes back to another question you had about like when to do it. So most people in the survey said that they would uh, talk with mom about this education at the first visit after we find out they're pregnant and then also about one month after delivery. Um, so I think that's a good timing of when to kind of take up the subject. In terms of like making sure it gets done, that's kind of up to you, but I would uh, encourage you to make phone calls to mom to see if she has any additional questions. I found that when you empower mom with the information, she's very motivated to have the pediatrician look at this. Um, and I've actually had pediatricians call me just to confirm the information and ask lingering questions. So I would say it's really effective to have that education. Thank you. I have another question for Hillary. We're good on time. I think we're good on time. We had like 30 minutes. <laughs> um, and now I lost it. Sorry. Oh, do you um, have any approaches or strategies um, about like following up when patients do have to use one pharmacy and like ask them about barriers that they're experiencing? So we didn't do that with this project. I would love to oh man, if we can pull something together before this upcoming major pharmacy switch that a lot of people are having, I would love to find out people's experiences filling just with our health system pharmacy versus having to use multiple potentially national pharmacies to fill their drugs and see how their patient experience has changed. Um, we didn't do that as part of this project, unfortunately, but I think it would be incredible. I mean, of course I hear what patients are telling me in clinic and so anecdotally 
yeah, I can tell you the patient experience is much better using one pharmacy, especially when it's our health system pharmacy. I just don't have the data on it. And then did you collect data? So um, one person was saying sometimes they'll typically write for the door names to be doing it twice daily, but they know that usually, you know, they would do it once daily, but then if like an exacerbation, did you, you know? Yeah, we don't that? typically, we don't typically write our uh, door names off of prescriptions that way. So if we, a lot of times we just write our uh, door names prescriptions as once a day, and then they would more commonly, we would be writing their hypertonic saline prescription as twice a day with a option to increase during illness to three to four times a day. Um, so our standard practice is not to like essentially overwrite the Dornay's Alpha prescriptions. And the data we collected here was just in pediatric patients, but I don't know that we have any that are prescribed twice a day. Um, so that wouldn't have been an issue. Um, and, and also just to reiterate, this was done in 2019. And so at that point, we didn't have as many people who were just doing their Dornay's kind of PRN <laughs> um, like we do now with people being on ETI. So I would say during this time period, I feel pretty strongly that if they were prescribed Pulmazyme daily, or sorry, Dornay's daily, that's how they should have been taking it. And I'm going to throw out another shameless plug for CF Farm. If you guys, with the upcoming uh, change for the National Pharmacy, if y'all want to pull together to pull um, to share data um, and show a certain drug company why this was a bad decision, um, there are several of us who are talking about um, pulling our collective data with regards to patient outcomes, time to therapy, all of that. Um, so CF Farm is at work. So. One more question for Hillary. Um, the, the patients who are using one pharmacy, is there like a specific auto refill system? And you know, could that have been a possible yeah. confounder? Um, so our patients who use one pharmacy would typically be using our health system pharmacy. We do not auto refill. We very rarely do 90 day supplies of these medications. We do not have texting. So I actually think if we had any of those things that some of these national pharmacies have, our data would look even better. So we're doing all this and providing better patient service without any of those forms of technology than these national pharmacies are doing. So love that question. Um, and I think if we had any of that, this would be even more impressive. <laughs> um. I had a question for Sabrina. So I am at a pediatric center, but we typically will transition people quickly who are pediatric patients who get pregnant to the adult center. Um, so how do, have you had that happen? And like, how do those conversations go? Because like, obviously the care team's brand new and then you're asking, you know, to make these decisions and maybe that might be a challenge. Right, yeah, thank you for that question. Cause I, I, I should have mentioned this during my talks, but, um, so I think some people who took the survey really felt like this is kind of more for the adult team to care about um, because they're the ones typically taking care of mom who gets pregnant, right? But I think it's good for us to all know where we can help um, because in that scenario, um, it would be good to be able to give some kind of pass off to the adult team to say, hey, here's the rundown of the patient. And I think too, like one piece that is easy to forget is we need that like social background about mom and how she might perceive this information that shared decision making kind of thing is gonna be really important when we talk about transitioning a patient in this scenario. So um, any information that a pediatric center can give to an adult center if you find yourself in that situation would be super helpful. I think in our scenario, um, you know, we, I, I flip on both sides of the coin, so I see both adult and, and pediatric patients. And for those centers who have crossover i know we share our social worker and our nutritionist and pharmacy and our teams and so that does help a little bit because we do the same thing in our center where our patients if they become pregnant quickly shift to the adult clinic um, and so that continuity of having some of those folks who do work on both sides of the the street so to speak does help that patient feel more comfortable when we're making that abrupt shift um, to the adult clinic and a lot of our patients we've been working with them since they were 18 to 21 to get them ready for transition but this kind of speeds up that process a little bit uh, for some of that so yes thank you yeah. uh, 
I, I may know the answer to those questions. I think I mostly got all the questions, but um, Madeline, just a point of clarification. Um, did you look at any other data like sweat chlorides or PFTs and how those related to lower um, drug concentrations? But they were they were healthy volunteers, so I'm, I'm not. Yes, yeah, yeah they, were, they were healthy volunteers. So these patients did not have CF. Yeah. Okay. In your previous, did you, you have had some experience with using this? Yes. Right so, at those case studies? Yeah, in the clinical case studies, uh, that I mentioned, the three patients that were on Ivacaptor monotherapy or ETI. Uh, I believe we did take uh, FEV1 and sweat chloride measurements, and they maintained stable pulmonary function with standard dose rifabutin, yes. But our, uh, the study that I presented the results from, the plasma concentration data is from healthy volunteers, yeah. Sorry. This has been lingering in my mind since I've heard some of these talks yesterday and today, but um, I know that we have a lot of altered kinetics in our patients with CF. Have y'all done any kinetic modeling in patients with cystic fibrosis for any of these drugs that you've talked about, like rifabutin and any of those other things, to see if there are any changes in that AUC50 and AUC90 rather than healthy, healthy volunteers? Um, so, just to make sure I understand you correctly, do you mean like if I have or if we have done modeling in a simulated CF patient population? In an actual CF patient. No, the, the study you looked at was looking at healthy volunteers mm -hmm. and those sorts of things, but for the occasion that we're actually using this in a patient with CF, have we had any kinetic modeling in those patients? Uh, no, we have not yet. Okay. Um, we just have... Uh, as you mentioned, the, some real clinical like scenarios where rifabutin has been used. Um, but I think that this study in healthy volunteers uh, definitely justifies the need for another pharmacokinetic study potentially in people with CF. But no, it has not. It has not been done yet. No. Does anyone from the audience want to ask? I know there was some like other nuanced questions sort of about the multiple versus single pharmacy, but I think I got the majority of like what the, <laughs> what the discussion was or Hillary um, pointed it out. So, but if I didn't, if I missed your point, feel free to step up. Yeah. Sure. I just have a, a comment. Um, my name's Taylor. I'm a pharmacist for pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. And I did want to say that um, we have seen some stuff on the listserv of people trying rifabutin. Um, with full dose Trikafta and I was somebody who was like excited to try it and I had convinced my provider and then the patient was enrolled in an NTM trial which is supposed to be just observational but you know this provider you know really likes to discuss treatment plans with other physicians and so they deferred to the NTM experts and the NTM experts felt pretty strongly about avoiding modulators if you're going to use the rifamycin, so I think that this work is really, really going to be impactful, and I hope that you guys continue to do more um, so that we make sure that our patients are getting good NTM treatment, but also getting the modulators that we know that they will benefit from. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a great comment. Thank you. We're just were, the, were those pharmacists, pharmacologists, like infectious disease specialists? Um, I believe they were physicians and maybe... Okay. Uh, more ID specialist, more NTM specialist, okay. um, and it was for the either the patients or the PREDICT trials was specifically what we were looking at. Thanks. I just want to make sure. This was a great session. Oh, wait, more. Okay. Yeah, go. No, go. You go. Um, so we can appeal site of service when requesting PAs for IV infusions through the medical insurance benefit, but just curious if you've tried to appeal like site of service or like pharmacy. Um, just based on your data is like amazing. So I just wonder if you like submitted that part and one more. So we have not tried to, to my knowledge, we have not tried to appeal for the site of service when it's a primary insurance plan that is covering the medication and it has a um, contracted specialty pharmacy. Yeah. Honestly, I, <laughs> I don't know that we're going to win that and and yeah. I would love for my team to chime in on this because we have had to go through this process in certain situations where patients have a primary and a secondary uh, prescription plan and they have different contracted pharmacies and we can't even win in those scenarios. So getting the primary and secondary to agree on the same contracted pharmacy and appealing one of them, usually we appeal the secondary to cover at the same site as the primary 
is often not successful. So I don't know that that's going to be a winning battle, unfortunately, but that'd be I great. I knew the answer. It's just that with your data that you have, I just wonder if you tried to submit that along with your appeal and if that made a difference. I think it's worth a try because yeah. I think it is the best thing for our patients. Yeah. I just, yeah, I don't want to be pessimistic, but <laughs> best luck. I think we all have a healthy dose of cynicism <laughs> with insurance companies. Um, I do know that there are some plans that do offer and looking at Billy, my wonderful technician, I know um, TRICARE technically does. I have a patient who calls on a monthly basis to fill their enzyme where they want to, um, but it's limited to like per month. So it's a huge time commitment um, and with everything else that we're all trying to deal with, sometimes that can be really challenging as well. But but I think if we can continue to um, produce data and maybe insurance companies will have a heart. I don't know. Uh, maybe by the time <laughs> I retire, <laughs> I don't think that'll happen. And I love the idea of, of putting in that effort to, um, to accomplish that and be able to get people to fill at the pharmacy that they want to fill at or is most convenient or best serves them. But I think we have to balance like our level of work that we're going to put in for that outcome and also the whole point of this is to make it easier and you know more convenient for the patient and if they have to call every month and fight with someone on the phone that defeats the purpose um then they might as well be just using the preferred pharmacy because i think we're putting extra work on people as a result of the system that we have so and i think that brings up the larger point of advocacy which the cf foundation has a huge advocacy group with um, compass and so if we can help continue to provide them with data for them to take on up higher up to legislation. I think that's potentially where our hope for a solution maybe uh, might come from. But All right, anybody else? This is a great session, great discussion. Thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your conference.